Okay, this is air pollution. This is video one. Um, obviously, I'm borrowing Dr. E's PowerPoint. Uh, this is chapter 18 and 19 in your textbooks. Okay, so we're going to focus first on the um, atmosphere, on uh, the composition, origins of the atmosphere, so you know that so you know the different parts of the atmosphere before we start talking about what's polluting the atmosphere. Um, so the original atmosphere, we've gone through three stages. The first one um, surrounded the um, homogeneous planet before the different layers had settled down when the, when the Earth was just one solid um, ball of everything mixed together with no difference anywhere. Um, that atmosphere was composed primarily of hydrogen and helium. And then the second atmosphere, as stuff started to evolve, as the Earth started to separate into the different layers, um, you had gases that were released from those layers, water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, chlorine, hydrogen gas, ammonia, all that stuff um, was released from, um, from inside the earth and moved into the atmosphere. That allowed the formation of the ocean, oceans as the water especially um, hit the atmosphere and then started um, forming the earliest life forms. Um, so the modern atmosphere only evolved from that after cyanobacteria started up. Um, so one of the first life forms was some form of cyanobacteria um, and they were photosynthetic. Um, so they took the carbon dioxide um, and with and the sun's energy in a, the same form of photosynthesis we see in plants today, turned it into um, oxygen and water and that allowed um, the current atmosphere that we have um, to start to produce, which allowed more life to start forming because they were dependent, more animals to start forming because, because they were dependent on the oxygen and then it continued um, cycling from there. Um, we didn't get the amount of oxygen that we have now until about 400 million years ago. So when the dinosaurs, when most of the dinosaurs were there, um, there was significantly less oxygen levels in the atmosphere than there are today. Current atmosphere is super thin. That's the whole point of this slide. You can look at the amounts. You can look at the uh, information there. Make sure you know the atmosphere is really, really thin. Okay, there are four levels um, that you need to know. The other two are kind of a um, little bit extra. The ionos ionosphere, not all scientists agree on. Um, and the exosphere is above, technically, that's, that's space. That's outer space. Um, so the troposphere is the lowest, it's closest to us. And then the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere make sure that you guys know this chart and these temperature fluctu fluctuations, which I'm going to talk about on the next slides. So make sure that you guys are comfortable with this. So um, the troposphere is the first one. Um, so that starts at the Earth's surface at zero miles, goes all the way up to somewhere between five and nine miles. It really depends on where you are in the world. So at the poles, North and South Pole, it's actually much thinner and only extends to about five miles. Um, as you get closer and closer to the equator, it is larger and extends up to about nine miles. Um, this is the most dense layer. This is where the temperature decreases. The temperature, like I said, is where you really need to be looking at that chart, that graph that I sh just showed you in the last slide. Make sure you're comfortable with that. Huge temperature drop in the troposphere. Um, they talk about this in movies all the time, how as you go up, you know, it gets colder and colder. Um, this is where all the weather is happening, which makes sense, right? If you're up flying in plane, you go through the cloud layer up until you hit above the cloud layer. Um, so that makes sense that all the weather happens at or below that cloud layer. Um, this is about 75% of the mass of the atmosphere, and then we'll talk about the composition in a couple minutes. Stratosphere is the next one. That goes from that 5 to 9 miles up until about 31 miles high. Much drier, much less dense. Um, the temperature now is increasing, um, and that's because we're absorbing a whole lot of radiation, of ultraviolet radiation. Um, the ozone layer is in here, and that helps to absorb and scatter it, so it contains that heat, that temperature. And this is the, almost the rest of the whole air atmosphere. So we get 75% in the first one, and then now we go between the first two up to 99%. So there's, what, 24% more in the stratosphere. Mesosphere, pretty basic, um, up to 50 miles, 30 to 50 miles. Temperature is decreasing again. Um, and then the thermosphere is the highest, up to 75 miles, and then increasing temperature again, incredibly warm temperatures. I mean, you, you have no protection from solar radiation, um, so it's going to be really, really hot. Um, and that's that last um, layer before you hit outer space, before you hit the exosphere. 
Okay, the composition of um, the atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen. There's a lot of nitrogen. People don't realize that. We're not breathing pure oxygen by any means. We're only, the air that we breathe only has about 21% oxygen. So that's when you hear, you know, people that um, have medical problems or um, are having problems breathing or for whatever reason have stress on their bodies, it's very good for them. Um, like, for example, when I was in labor with Dylan, they gave me, they had me breathe through a mask of pure oxygen because that helps if your body is stressed out for whatever reason and you can get more oxygen, your body has to work less in order to breathe and get the oxygen it needs, and that's a good thing. So they had me breathing pure oxygen for a while. So you see that a lot in medical stuff. Um, there's that water content quite a bit, and then um, the ozone layer um, we'll talk about later, and obviously the carbon dioxide as well. Okay, so seasonal changes. Um, we see seasonal changes happening primarily because the Earth is tilted. So hopefully you guys, this is just review, um, but, the, but for those of you that you know, aren't remembering it or for whatever reason um, don't know this yet, know that we, we know that the Earth is tilted 23 degrees on its axis um, so that that creates opposite seasons. So the northern hemisphere, when we're summertime up here, it's wintertime down here. Um, and vice versa, and that determines air circulation patterns. So let me show you examples of that. Um, so as we start with the North Pole, if you're looking at the Northern Hemisphere, um, when that is tilting toward the sun, when that tilt is over this way, so all through the summertime for us, summer months for us, we're getting more warmth because we're tilted toward the sun, which is more radiation. So we're seeing summer in the Northern Hemisphere. On the opposite side of the Earth, the s southern hemisphere is tilted away. And remember, the whole Earth is spinning around and around and around. So this side at nighttime will be this side at daytime. So you're going to see this. But it's always tilted away. Hopefully that I didn't, I didn't lose anybody there. Um, so even with the 24-hour day-night cycles, this part of the Earth is always tilted that way. And this part of the Earth is always tilted this way, which means that this part is always getting more sun. So on the southern hemisphere, we see uh, winter time when it is tilted away. Opposite to that, now we're looking at um, in the winter time up here, you know, from the months of maybe October through like March, we're seeing um, less radiation. The sun is tilted, or we are tilted away from the sun, so it's colder, um, and we're seeing winter time up here. And then um, the other side of the earth in the South Pole, it's now, you know, at this time of year for us, is summertime in Australia because they're getting their tilted toward the sun and they're getting all the sunlight right pointed toward them. Okay, so ocean currents. Um, ocean currents, sea surface temperature influences the air temperature um, simply because water is such a huge source, um, has, has such a high carrying capacity for heat. It's able to absorb so much heat energy. Um, so that means that it's exchanging constantly with the air um, around it and that's pushing you know as, as heat rises so that warm air is going to rise it's going to push colder air down cause a whole bunch of air circulation patterns just like it happens with water in the ocean so we see um, surface ocean currents what's what's being pushed and moved around with warm water um, at the poles pushing in different places two types of ocean currents the surface currents is only about 10 percent of the water um, for the upper 400 meters are really very much just at the surface, just a thin layer at the top um, is pushing stuff around. And then um, the deep water currents is 90% of the water. Um, these are driven by density, um, so as the water at the surface is warmed up by the sun, by solar radiation, uh, it will move out of the way, and then the um, cold water is getting pushed up because it's um, more dense. Um, and we'll be moving around and that creates the vertical forces um, that move ocean currents. So these deep waters, and that only happens in a few specific places because the more dense water obviously will want to stay at the ocean floor, but there's these few places that it's forced upward which causes those circulation patterns. And the forcing upward comes from um, like the presence of an island or a continent or um, a underwater volcano, something that pushes that, that deep water current up toward the surface, and those are upwelling locations. Okay, um, so the primary forces that move water um, is the solar heating, the winds, the gravity, and the Coriolis effect. 
So the solar heating and the winds, that's what I was just talking about that's going to move the surface currents. That's moving them, pushing that warm water around um, all over the world. Um, gravity is pushing, the, um, driving the density driven currents. That was that second slide, that deep water currents I was talking about. And the Coriolis effect. Um, Coriolis is this big concept that we don't need, we don't have the time to take in this class. Know that it exists. There's a whole lot of crazy math behind it. Um, but it essentially determines in what pattern um, the water currents will flow northern in the, um, sorry, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. And so those, um, those factors drive um, all of the ocean currents and therefore a lot of the air circulation patterns as well. And then the secondary forces um, influence where the water actually moves. Okay, so this is looking at the sea surface temperature. It's exactly what you would expect. No surprises there. Um, we know what latitude is already. You guys can flip through this. Um, we know already from our climate stuff that the higher latitudes, bigger differences in temperature and climate, daylight hours. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please make sure you ask me. Um, this would be like, you know, as we're looking up here, they're getting a whole lot less sunlight because, look, it's in the dark for a whole lot, you know, more time. And um, so places like Alaska, North Pole, get less and less daylight as it gets closer to winter. Um, air temperatures. So as all the en energy from the sun reaches the Earth, um, it's obviously going to heat up stuff near the equator more so than the poles. It makes sense. The equator's closer. Um, so we're going to have the warm air and the warm water move toward the poles from the equator. And then the cold air and the water at the poles is going to move toward the equator. Um, so it's just a circular pattern thing um, that is working to equalize the temperature. Remember, everything wants to be in equilibrium. Everything wants to be balanced. So the cold stuff is going to move toward the warm. The warm stuff is going to move toward the cold to try and attempt. It's this continual balancing that tries to bring us um, to equilibrium and that causes our changing weather. All of those air circulation patterns is what pushes around the moisture in the air, pushes around wind, pushes around all the stuff and that causes our weather. Okay, um, so this is kind of summarizing what I was just saying, that energy imbalance uh, as the solar heats more energy at the equator than the poles, that creates an imbalance and so then the Earth always tries to balance that out um, by moving the water and the air around to try and equalize, to reach equilibrium. Okay, air pressure is caused by the weight of air pressing down the Earth, the ocean and the air below it. Um, it depends on the amount of air above it, the measuring point, and falls as you go higher, which makes sense, right? We have more pressure closer to the Earth, so the air pressure would be less the higher up you go. Um, changes with the weather, so that's what we talk about with a low pressure system and a high pressure system with weather, um, is that change in air pressure as stuff tries to equilibri equal equilibriize, I think that's a made up word, as it tries to balance out, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, um, so in a high pressure area, the air is going to compress and get warmer as it gets, um, as it moves down. Um, that inhibits the formation of clouds, meaning it's mostly sunny. So a high pressure system is nice sunny weather, it's a really pretty day, um, you don't really have any clouds. However, if there's a lot of moisture in the air already, that's when you can get haze and fog. Um, and then a low pressure system is the exact opposite of that. Um, it's the air moving upward, it's expanding, um, it's getting colder, there's, for, there's the formation of clouds, um, and then potentially rain and storms and stuff like that. So this is a summer summarizing of weather, which obviously is a whole lot more complicated than that, but that's the basics that you guys need to know. Okay, um, so this is summarizing again, a high pressure system. Um, air is going to descend uh, and flow out clockwise around the ground. A low pressure system is going to go up, uh, so it's going to, I'm sorry, go counterclockwise first and then go up. And that's what forms the bad weather. Okay, humidity um, is the amount of water vapor in the air um, compared to the potential amount at the current temperature. Um, so it's a percentage. So, you know, if, if we we're at 50 degrees Celsius, um, how much water is in the air versus how much water could actually fit in the air before it started to actually fall as rain. Um, depends on the air temperature, the air pressure, and the amount of water that there is. 
Um, we have about 326 million cubic miles of water total over the whole Earth, period. That's, that's everything. Um, only about 3,100 is in the air at any given time in either water vapor, clouds, or precipitation. Okay, so we're looking at um, water vapor, um, whether it's going to rain, precipitation, whether it's going to rain or not, so you guys can walk through this. Make sure you step through these, and you know, step by step, look at these different scenarios so you understand what's going on with the um, airflow and um, water in each of these scenarios. Cloud cover. Um, there's clouds about 40% covering the earth at any given time. Um, if there were no clouds at all, we we get 20% more heat from the sun, so they serve a very important purpose in not allowing the world to overheat. Um, they reflect the sunlight back into space, which is known as the albedo effect, or just albedo. Um, but they also reduce the amount of heat into space because they absorb some of it. So not only do we ref they reflect it back, they also absorb it, which means that um, some of it's re-radiated back down into them. So um, traps heat like a blanket. So they can be, that's why there's that temperature spike um, right around that cloud thing because, or right above that, because they're reabsorbing and re-radiating it. Uh, precipitation, airs containing the water vapor, um, as it cools off, condenses into liquid water, which falls as rain, as freezing rain, as sleet, as snow, as snow pellets, or as hail, depending on the size. So precipitation is any of the following things. It's all of which is just liquid water. Depends on the temperature for which one you get, obviously. And then it depends on the size of the granules as to which, um, which one of these, like snow, snow pellets, or hail. So I think... Um, yeah, we're going to stop there for this video.